You feel the presence of God this morning? Amen. Amen. You've got to know that you will never be the same when God is teaching you. Uh, the name of the service this morning is Ever Increasing Glory. Can we say that out loud? Say ever, ever increasing, increasing glory. glory. Say it again. Ever, ever increasing, increasing glory. glory. Father, I want to pray this morning for your revelation to your children. We pray that every single person under the sound of my voice or who hears this service will understand clearly because they were directed by you. We thank you for your wisdom and your clarity. Pray that everything that I speak be your word and not my own. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, last week we spoke on being a letter from, for, uh, from Christ. Um, and being a letter from Christ is important. Um, it's not about what you think. It's about what God thinks. And so you got to ask yourself this question. What do you, I represent? Do I represent the old agreement or the new agreement? Do I represent the old covenant or the new covenant? Do I represent the Old Testament or the New Testament? Um, and so the Old Testament, the old agreement, it identifies unfixable rebellion. Every time somebody may fulfill certain areas of the law, they still operate in rebellion when it comes to God because when God sees you, he doesn't see anything else but do you know his son? And so the Old Testament, the old agreement represents and identifies rebellion against the Lord, the unforgiven sins. We're going to be reading from 2 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 3. And so um, the new agreement which we all fall under, represents freedom. It is the new agreement, the new covenant, the new testament. It represents freedom uh, through faith, faith in Jesus Christ, following his ways, incorporating his values, and displaying his love. That all operates when uh, we listen to the, the wisdom of God. And so in Paul's letter, we're talking from the Apostle Paul, one of his letters. In his letter to the Corinthian church, it's a letter that he wrote to the Corinthian church specifically for them about the false teaching and giving them direction um, on how to run the church. In Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, Paul identified the false teaching. And how many people in here know that the false teaching uh, still exists? Uh, false teaching is just simply taking scripture and twisting it, twisting it in whatever way you want to. Just taking it off a little bit is false teaching. And so he, Paul, letter to the Corinthian church, identified his false teaching as wicked. Out for self-value, out for self-glorification. Um, and how many of us know that as a letter from Christ, meaning, meaning a representative of Christ, meaning a person who follows Christ, what Christ says, what he means, uh, and instead of harboring anger, you learn how to forgive. How many people have went through that challenge? Yes. Instead of harboring, you know, instead of uh, harboring bitterness, you learn how to let go. How many people have learned how to let go? But how many people have harbored bitterness before? And so instead of operating in hate, you operate in love now. You used to hate folks and hold a grudge against them for, for the rest of your life, but now you learn how to love them even though you may not agree with them. How many people have experienced that before? Yeah. And so as a letter from Christ, these are certain challenges that we have, and it should always be in our lives because we've all had challenges at work. We've all had challenges at, in, in the, uh, at the job and every place else we've been, but the main focus should always be what would Jesus do or what does Jesus have to say about it? What does Jesus mean when he said this? It should always be about Jesus, not about our work, not about our trials, not about our tribulations, but what does Jesus have to say about it? And then we should be following that. That's what a letter from Christ, that's what a representative of a letter from Christ would be. And that's what we should be. We should be letters from Christ. And when people see you, they should identify you as a Christian like that. Why? Because you're always showing love. 
if they identify you uh, as somebody mean, somebody rude, you're not being the letter you're supposed to be. And so we're always supposed to be letters from Christ. Somebody should always be able to come to you and say and, and talk to you about something because you're not judging them. You're not holding things against them. And so as letters from Christ, it should always be about what Jesus has to say about things. Now, Paul, in his ministry, is having to deal with these false teachers. Um, and I want you to write this down. They're called Judaizers. Judaizers. Some people say Judaizers, but Judaizers um, is the name of these false teachers. They, had, they were legalists who believed in a powerful government was the key to social order. So if you had a powerful government, if the government was structured and put together and taking care of the government, then that would create social order. And so uh, by any means necessary is the way they did that. And uh, the, the problem with the Judaizers is they were Christian Jews. They were actually Christian Jews. And so they were Christians, but they had uh, Jewish backgrounds. They had the backgrounds of Judaism. Judaism was the Old Testament beliefs. The, the, the first five books of the Bible is what they taught back then. When they taught, when the Pharisees taught, they taught Judaism. And when they taught Judaism, they taught the first five books of the Bible. So when they're called Judaizers, they're called Judaizers because they follow those principles, yet they're still trying to be a Christian. How many people in here know that as a Christian, you gotta let go of something because God created, I mean, Jesus completed the laws. He completed all of them. He fulfilled every single one of them. You know what you do? You operate in freedom. Now, there was a challenge because the people who came from Judaism came to Christ and said, I believe in him. However, I'm gonna bring some of my Old Testament ways. And that's why they're called Judaizers, because these were Christian Jews inside the church. Now, if you know anything about false teachers, you know that false teachers are not outside, not, not people who teach other faiths and teach other things. These are people internal, people who understand the scripture incorrectly. These are the false teachers he's talking about, the people who came inside his church, stood under the unction of his teaching, and then went back and tried to sway people in the wrong direction. That's what the Judaizers represent. They were Christian Jews. And they had tried, they tried over and over and over to impose their Jewish way of life on the Gentile Christians. Now, I say that because you had the Judaizers who came from the Jewish belief, and then you had the Gentiles who didn't believe in anything at one time, and then Paul comes in and, and teaches Jesus Christ, so you, you pull some of the, the people from the Old Testament beliefs, and then you pull some of the people who never believed in God, and all these people come together, and there's a clash of the titans. Because you have people who say, man, I'm circumcised and I'm this and I've taught this and I've studied this and all that. And then you have people say, well, I've been free. I didn't believe in God, but now I believe in Jesus Christ. And the person saying, well, you got to, you got your way to Christ. However, you have to do this. And when they clashed, they become, became problems. So the same thing happens here. You've got different people from different faiths who come from different backgrounds and different, you know, different religions and everything else. But Christianity is bringing a bunch of misfits together and believing on one accord in Jesus Christ. So, Paul and his ministry is having to do with the, deal with these Judea, uh, Judaizers. Um, the name Judaizer, I want to give you some information. Literally, it means to live according to Jewish customs and traditions. So what they did was infiltrate the church and try to bring their ways and try to pull people to believe in their, their ways. Now, look, uh, I need you to understand this. In the office, if you're at your office, if you have a place of business where you work, in the office there may be a boss who comes in and tries to change things and make things their ways, and that's okay. Because that's the office. At, at home, you, you may um, uh, used to have done things one way, but then you have a new boss called the wife that comes in comes in, and then when the wife comes in, they change it and make things their own way. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. Man, men are kind of quiet here. <laughs> they like knocking on me. not talking about you. So when, when, when you have that, you, you learn to negotiate with the people. You negotiate at home. You negotiate at the office. But, 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 but that's different. But when it comes to church, 
It is up to you to understand the scripture correctly. Not just know the scripture, but to understand it. You must be able to interpret it, to know what's right and know what's wrong. It's not up to me. It's up to me to teach the word. It's up to you to take it in and understand it. And so, when it comes to a true life with God, you have to understand his directions. You have to guard yourself from, from any intrusions. How many people know that there are people who teach the word incorrectly out there? And if you don't know that, because you haven't learned it for yourself, you may sit under somebody who teaches the word incorrectly. And if that happens to you, you've set, in your, you've set yourself up for failure. So, because of misunderstanding or misinterpretation of God's words, it's led Christians to completely be off track with God. And so the Judaizers would say things like, you almost have salvation. They would talk to the people of the church and say, oh, it's great that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's great that you've been baptized. It's great that you, you, you come to church and you do all that. But now you must be circumcised, which is a thing of the old covenant. And if you understand what Paul said about circumcision, he would say, no, uh, circumcision right now, before it was holy, now it's just cutting up the flesh. You're just mutilating your flesh. But Paul would always be on these Ju uh, Judaizers because they were always in the church. They were always causing problems. And they were always, you know, having differences. And they were always acting like they knew Paul and acting like they knew the scripture and acting like they understood the scripture. scripture. But when Paul left, when Paul went away, when Paul was in prison for teaching the word, the Judaizers would come in and they would lift themselves up and make themselves holier than that. And so Paul's issue with the Judaizers was not whether or not a person followed Jewish customs because he did not care. It didn't matter whether you followed the old Jewish customs. Look, there's some things I do from the past that I still do that, that I, I do spiritually for God, but that's, that's me, that's okay. But none of that brings on salvation. And so what he's saying is circumcision has nothing to do with salvation. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. You can eat meat or not eat meat, but it has nothing to do with salvation. Salvation only comes through Christ. Your belief, that's it. You can be a bishop, a pastor, you can be this person, that person. You can have 10,000 people in your service. But Christ, only Christ is the direction to God. So Paul is saying, look, I don't care if y'all do it. If you want to do it your way, if you want to believe, if you want to uh, be circumcised and circumcise your children and all that, that's fine. But the true direction to God is through Jesus Christ. And none of you in here should be telling anybody otherwise. That's what he was telling them. So, Paul is expressing about the law and these, all these things that these Judaizers did were part of the law. That's the law, that's the Old Testament. Those are the Old Testament ways. If you try to live by the law and fail at one of them, you fail the whole law. And so Paul is telling them continuously, look, the law brings death. Why does it bring death? Because it doesn't fix anything. You can go to church for the rest of your life and follow the Old Testament commandments and follow all that stuff, and you may have followed 99% of them wrong, but it takes one sin, one sin to send you to Hades. It takes one sin. It, 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 it ain't about when you learned right and you started doing right. It was when you fought with a kid over a rattle when you were young. It's when you argued with a child. It's when you snatched something away from or disrespected your parents or didn't listen to your mom. Even the fact that you didn't know about it had nothing to do with it. So, so Paul is expressing here, we're reading from 3.7. Paul is expressing here that the law brings death because it doesn't fix anything. Why? Because we can't fix what we didn't break. The law didn't cause the problems. The law has always existed with God. But it's what Adam and Eve did that caused the problem. And so we can't change what Adam and Eve did. You can't, Adam and Eve is just a mirror of sin and how sin came in. You can't go into that mirror and fix anything because it's already done. So sin is already in existence. It's already done. There's nothing you can do about it. The only path 
through sin is to Jesus Christ. So we want to read this here. 3 7 is where we're at. 3 7 says this Now, if the ministry that brought death was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of Moses' glory. Now, let me explain what he's talking about here. Um, what he's talking about here is he's talking about the always fading and passing uh, glory that the, the problem that we had that they had then was because when Moses, um, uh, some of you have read the Old Testament when Moses. Um, came down from the, from Mount Sinai, and that's Exodus. I want you to write this down: Exodus 34, 29 through 35. When Moses went up the mountain, he went up the mountain to talk to God, and when he communicated with God, he he got the two tablets. Remember the Ten Commandments. He got all the commandments on the two tablets, and he took the tablets back down the the mountain. Now this man had just been with God, and so if he just been with God, he's glowing. Why? Because God, he was in the presence of God. God, the, 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 the spirit of God, the Holy One, the, the great I Am, the author and the finisher of our faith. He was in front of him. And so to be in the presence of God, you have to come back glowing. And so he came back from down the mountain with two tablets of the laws. The laws, the covenants, the agreements between the Israelites and God. And so Moses is excited. So Moses is coming down. Can you see Moses walking with these two tablets in his hand and he's walking down and just glowing of God. Glowing. I'm talking about literally glowing. They can see. And so here's the deal. Aaron and the Israelites seen him coming. And when they seen him coming, they noticed he was glowing. So much that they were afraid to talk to him. They didn't even want to walk towards him because he was glowing literally like the sun. He was glowing and he, he was walking towards them and they were scared. They were frightened because of Moses coming down with the glory of God upon him. And they were afraid to approach him. I can imagine them saying, man, you, you know, there's something wrong with your face, man. We can't come over here, you, you know, you glowing, you know. Can y'all imagine him looking, uh, if you see me come in glowing, you'd be like, Pastor, there's something wrong. I'm not going to come near you or touch you. You have something. So they said, you, you see Moses coming, and he's glowing with the light of God. And they're like, no, dude, we're not going to touch you. Don't, don't. And Moses had to call them and tell them to come towards him. And so uh, they were afraid. And when Moses came towards him, he was glowing and his face was lit up. And when they, he came towards him, he brought the law. And uh, the law, of course, was perfect. And so Paul, who's a Pharisee, who taught the same law, acknowledges that it brings death. And his conversion to Christianity, because if you understand Paul, Paul went from teaching the same law to Christianity. He went from persecuting Christians to becoming a Christian. So how do you come from uh, with the government, you're with them, you're doing their work, you're going out Christ uh, looking for these Christians and thinking everything they're doing is wrong and against God. How do you go towards them and, and, and you're arresting them and putting them in jail and persecuting them and killing them and doing all those things? You go from that to becoming one of them. It has to be the love of God. And so here's the deal. Paul is now, Paul went from teaching that to now saying that that law is death. The law that he taught before is death. And so his conversion to Christianity wasn't because the law was tainted, because the law had no problem. The law was still glorious. But Moses, when he came down from the mountain, his glowing that was the law. That was the law of God. And so he glued, he, he had the glowing happening because he was coming down from the mountain from visiting with God. But here's the problem. He would teach them the laws and read the laws to him, to them. And you know what happened? The glory faded after he finished. Not because there was something wrong with the laws, but because there was something wrong with man. Because he was with God, he was free from sin. But when he came down, he glowed of God, he taught of God. But when he stopped teaching of God, he became sinful again. Y'all get that? So the law was perfect, but no one was capable of fulfilling it. 
So you can live by the law all your life, but you're not capable of fulfilling it. You're not capable of fulfilling the way of the law. So, so while they did many things for the ministry without Jesus Christ, it, led, it leads to death. What I mean by that is this. Let's read uh, 3, 7, and 8. 3, 7, and 8, uh, the, the second part. It says, transitory, though it was, and that means passing away, meaning the glory passing away. So he said, Moses, because of its glory, transitory, uh, though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? So uh, when he's saying transitory, though it was, he's talking about it's always fading. Why? Because uh, even though Moses came down glowing, he went back, uh, he, uh, when he talked to his people, when he taught his people, he was still glowing. But after that, that same glory started to fade away from his face. So no matter how many times he went up the mountain, he would come down glowing, but he'd lean back up, not glowing. You get that? So no matter how many times you try to fulfill all the laws, no matter how many times you try to do things right, you may do one thing right, but the glory still leaves. Why? Because you're not capable of freeing yourself up from sin. You're incapable of doing that. And so what does that mean? It means that, that the glory always fades. No matter how many times they, they maintained the tabernacle, no matter how many times they had tabernacle service back then, no matter how many times they preached the word, no matter how many times they taught the word, the glory still faded. Why? Because it was incapable of completing them. Why? Because they still contained sin. So the, the law was glorious. But man still, was still flawed with sin. That's why he said this in verse 8. I want to read verse 8 real quick. Um, it says, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Be even more glorious. The law was good, but as long as it existed, even those that, are dedicated their, that have dedicated their lives to the law are still guilty. You can say, I'm having a relationship with God. I'm, I'm following the Old Testament ways. I'm doing all the things of the Old Testament. I'm, I'm praising God and doing all those other things. But without a Savior, you're still condemned. Why? Because sin came in through Adam. It didn't come in through you. So if you understand that, then you understand there has to be somebody in between. So living a life, doing that right, uh, doing all the things right of the Old Testament, that's okay. But it does not give you salvation. Salvation only comes through what? And that's through Jesus Christ. And so Moses didn't want them to see the fading of the glory. That's why he always wore a veil over his face. Because he wore a veil because he knew that even though he was teaching the laws to these people, it's short-lived because the laws doesn't bring, it does not bring them to salvation. It doesn't bring them to Jesus Christ. The only things that, that bring them to Jesus Christ is belief in the Savior, that he's done the work. You can be on the streets and have never done anything right in your life, and at that moment, believe in Jesus Christ. And because you believe, you have salvation. Or you can be in the church for 40, 50 years and not know him at all. So, verse 8, ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious. The ministry of the Spirit is through Jesus Christ. The ministry of the Spirit is talking about the Holy Spirit. It's talking about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so it's saying, through the Spirit of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, there is no other way. It's what would the Spirit do? What would Jesus do? It's all the same thing. When you listen to the Holy Spirit, you're listening to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is with the Father. He's sitting by the Father. He sent back the Holy Spirit to teach us all things. Tell us when we're wrong. Give us the feeling of right. Understand the scripture right. Interpret the scripture correctly. He's taught us all these things. And so it's always about what would the Spirit do? What would Jesus do? Now verse 9 and 10 says this. Verse 9 says, If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no, glow, uh, no glory now in the comparison with the surpassing glory. Now, what that means is if the ministry that brought condemnation, the ministry that brought condemnation is the Old Testament beliefs. Now, some people still have Old Testament beliefs. 
Some people still have Old Testament ways. And that's okay, but that's not what brings salvation. And what he's saying is if you still believe in everything else, if you still have faith in God but don't acknowledge the Son, you're living in the same condemnation that all the other people were living in. So the Old Testament beliefs that they're talking about bring condemnation. And he's saying that was glorious. See, they, though, these people, even though it brought condemnation and brought death, these people still experienced the glory of God. They still experienced the, the Ark of the Covenant. They still experienced miracles on earth. They still experienced God showing up and, 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 and protecting them and breaking down the walls of Jericho and doing all those other things. They still experienced all of that. But that does not lead to salvation. What leads to salvation is Jesus Christ. And so he's explaining that by saying if the ministry that brought condemnation was so glorious because it was, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Because it is. For what was glorious has no glory now in the comparison of the surpassing glory. Look, it was great to be with God and have him protect me if I'm out there like David and fighting people, if I'm out there like David and fighting and being able to destroy all these people because God has given me the strength. I, and that's okay, being able to follow the Old Testament beliefs and Old Testament rituals and all those things. That's all great. And that's glorious. But the true glory that's even more glorious is the one who came and died for us. The one who came and took the nails in his hand. The one who came and took the spikes in his hand. The one who came and was stabbed. The one who came and was brutalized for your sins. Now not only does David receive death on earth, but he receives life through Jesus Christ. That's the amazing thing. And so you've got to understand where you're at. You have the opportunity to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's nothing like that. There is something that like Moses and all of them wanted to know what you know now. They wanted to experience what you experience now. So the law that Paul taught as a Pharisee and thousands of other Pharisees teaching the same thing before him was not given for the purpose of salvation. I want you to write that down. The law that Paul, I mean, that Paul taught when he was Saul of, of Tarsus was not given for the purpose of salvation. God didn't give that, them laws and say, well, everybody will be saved through those laws. There was no salvation in obedience to the law. Only condemnation. Why? Because it makes us realize how dirty our faces are. The more laws we, we try to do right, the more times we realize we're not worthy. How many people have said, I'm not worthy? How many people understand that you're not worthy, that you've never done everything right, that as a little child you still did things against God? No matter how many times you went to church, no matter what type of church you went to, you still did things against God. And all that does, but why do you think people avoid church now? They say, oh man, because if I go to church, the church will burn down. Have y'all ever heard that before? How many people said that? Who said that before? Some of us in here have said that. Man, if I go to church, the structure, gonna, the walls, gonna, Jesus going to show up and say, get out of here, God. <laughs> you know. But you got to understand that all the law does is make us realize how dirty our faces is. It shows us, it gives us a mirror, a mirror image of how our faces look, of how our, we're consumed with sin. And the problem with the mirror is you cannot clean the image in the mirror. It's an image, you can't fix it. That image came from Adam, it doesn't come from you. And because that image came from Adam, you can't go into that mirror and clean out what you cannot reach. Verse 11, verse 11. He says again, and if what was transitory, meaning passing away, remember the glory came and it was on his face when he was in front of God, but when he got back down, the glory disappeared. Why? Because he was not with God anymore. And the sin still existed. If what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory which lasts? You know what that means? It means that Jesus forgave your sin before you even sinned. He forgave your sin before you took a step on the earth. Ephesians 1, 4 says that God chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. You know what that means? It means you were deemed holy before you thought you were holy. 
You were deemed holy before you knew anything about sin. You were deemed holy before you took a step on this earth, before you were in your mother's womb, before your parents knew or thought about having you. And the beautifulness of that is knowing that the holiness of God lasts forever. Meaning, he chose you. He drew you. John 6, 43 says that no one can come to Christ unless the Father draws him. You know what that means? You were drawn by the Father. So knowing that perfect plan, so it says, that before this transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of which the, that which lasts? So the, the incredible thing about this is verse 12 says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Paul wrote this, you gotta know the history of this. Paul wrote this dealing with the Judaizers when the two covenants were overlapping. One covenant was going out and the other, other covenant was coming in. People for thousands of years have believed in the Old Testament ways. People for thousands of years have followed the Old Testament way. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not do this. Thou shalt not cover the neighbor, cover thy neighbor, and do all these other things. They lived by those rules. They gave 10%, 23. It was actually 23.3% of their income. Some people say, I'm tithing. Tithing back then was 23% of your income, not 10% know your scripture. So sometimes we think we're doing right. We're doing right. We are showing honor to God. Honor to God is belief in his son. That's it. Following his son ways and understanding what his son says. So Paul wrote this when the covenants were overlapping. The new covenant of grace through Jesus Christ and the old covenant, which was the Old Testament ways. Yet others would not let go of the law. Now, he had the new covenant coming in and other the, the old covenant going out, but people still came in and would not let go of the law. That's why the Judaizers were causing problems because they mixed both. They brought the old with the new. Now, I know some of you in here have done that before. Has anybody ever mixed the old with the new? I, I, I'm going to have some of y'all. How many people remember cassette tapes? Tell the truth. How many people remember? I was the last man standing when it came to cassette tapes. I think I was. Unless some of y'all still have cassette tapes. Well, me too. So we're still standing, right? You shame, you feel shameful. You're like, I still have it. You still have a cassette player too, don't you? Uh -huh. Yeah, so do I. Um, but so so most of us in here remember cassette tapes. When they stopped making cassette tapes, how many people transitioned to CDs? Say, I'm going to CDs immediately. How many people immediately went out and got a CD? Or were y'all doing what I did? No, I'm gonna keep my cassette tapes. I got all this, these whole packages of cassette tapes. I got all my old music on, got all my old stuff on it. I'm gonna keep these cassette tapes. How many people got the, got, when they had CD players, you had dual. You had the CD player and the cassette. But tell the truth, how many people in here had that in your vehicle? You were not gonna just have a CD player because you had both. Tapes faded, and people boldly talked about CD players. People boldly talked about the new, the new coming in, and we were still selecting the old. Can I get an amen this morning? Does everybody understand what was going on then? Some people say, well, I'm, I'm older than that. I don't understand what you're talking about, Pastor. I didn't have anything to do with the tape decks or the CD player. My first car, 1979, a, two, uh, a 1979 Dodge Colt. I was happy about that car that only had three cylinders. I was happy about it. But that first car, when, when my father and I, my family and I helped me purchase it, when I got that car, it had an eight track player in it. Okay, so am I, am I, have I got to the level of some of the people in here? It had an eight track player. I remember exactly how it looked because it had the Manhattan transfer tape. Uh, I'm just telling you what it had in it. And so that eight track player had the Manhattan transfer and I played the heck out of the Manhattan transfer. I didn't even know who they were, but I played them over and over again. Why? Because it, came, it came with the car. It came with the car, so I kept playing it. And you know what? From that point, they transitioned, uh, transitioned to tapes. From eight tracks to, how many people remember that? From eight tracks to, the big eight track. Look almost like a VCR tape. In your car. 
And so I didn't transition to tape, so I'm going from the back. So some of you who did not understand the tape, the CDs, now I'm, I didn't transition to tape. I stuck with the eight track. You know what I did? I bought a converter. Y'all remember the converters? You had the eight track, and inside the eight track was a tape deck. If you remember that? That's what I had. I had the eight track with the tape player, and I was happy, because when people got in my car, I could play a tape, and I could play an eight track. Now the tape played fast. Some of y'all remember that? <laughs> the tape didn't play the same speed it was supposed to play. It played a little fast, so, so when you heard songs, you heard them a little fast, but people, it was just like that much. Their voices just went up a little awkward. And so, I'm telling you this so that you understand the old versus the new. We're the same way. We're resistant to change when it comes to things. Where if we've been in, in a certain faith for 30, 40 years, when God says move, when God changes us, you know what we do? We resist, we pull back. We still hold on to the eight track tapes. We still hold on to the cassette tapes. We still hold on to the CDs. How many people had the first CD player? And then they got the non-skip. You hit a bump with the first one, you had to wait about four or five seconds before your song came back on. How many, can I get an amen this morning? Who remembers those first ones? So the same thing happened with converting from the old covenant to the new covenant. Some did not want to change, just like we do the same exact thing. So we can't look at them and condemn them and make them bad people. We were the same way, and we're the same ways about things that go on in our lives now. We're resistant to change. God says move. We say, oh, God, I'm going to think about it. I think you're telling me to move. I don't know. I'm thinking about it, God. God done did everything but get you out of your house. You can't pay your bill anymore. You can't deal with your house. Your, your water bills do. Your rent's do. And you come to the pastor and say, Pastor, what do I do? I said, move. God is telling you to move. He's always going to provide for you. If he's not providing, he has another way for you to go. It's simple. Yeah, but, but people are, oh, no, Pastor Crazy, he's talking about the devil, I don't know, you don't understand. Then they go through the worst turmoil in their lives. So I'm telling you, you got to listen to God. So um, when all these things, so that's the same thing that happened from Kirk Burton from the Old Testament to the, um, from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. The thing coming is always bolder than the old. And that's what he's saying here in verse 13. He's saying, we, you know, well, in verse 12, he says, then, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Why? Because the new is coming in. He's teaching the new stuff. The old stuff is, is, is old. People weren't still pushing cassette tapes when I was moving to CD players. They weren't still saying, hey, you need to get this cassette tape player. It's a new one that still plays cassette. They weren't saying that. They were dwindling down. So was the old covenant with the new covenant. When the old covenant was going out, people were still trying to teach the old, but Paul was boldly teaching the new. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, all things are possible. So verse 13, we are not like Moses. Look at him. He's saying we are not like cassette tapes or eight tracks. That's what he's saying. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of, the, of what was surpassing away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. He's saying people are still stuck in the old. He says it has not been removed, removed because only in Christ is it taken away. When you let go of pride, when you let go of uh, conceitness, uh, all the problems that you think about, when you let go of everything else and give it to God, only he can cleanse you, can cleanse you of unrighteousness. Only he can take you away from Old Testament belief. Only he can take you in the right direction. Yeah. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Verse 15. He says, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their heart. Why? Because they still are operating with the tape decks. They are still operating in the old and not willing to accept the new. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Then it says, now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into the image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord 
who is the spirit. That means from faith to faith. That means from glory to glory. This is why you can be in church for five years and feel overjoyed to come to church today. You can be in church 10 years and feel overjoyed to come to church, even more overjoyed than you did five years ago. Why? Because you go from faith to faith. You go from glory to glory. God's ever increasing glory always makes you excited. This is why I can preach a sermon today, preach a sermon next, uh, the next day, all week, and still be excited the next week. Why? Because God's glory always prevails. This is why. Because his ever-increasing glory, if you let God lead you, he always takes you from one level to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. It never stops. It never ends. He's always with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Even if you dwindle back into your old ways, he's still with you. And when you come back, he'll help you back to the next level, to the next level, to the next level. How many people have dwindled away from God before? How many people have turned the cheek and not listened to him when he told you to move? How many people have not listened to him when he told you it's time, when he told you, I know you've been there, I know you've done this a thousand years, but now it's time to move. How many of us have dealt with that before? Every single one of us. So listening to God is more important because his ever-increasing glory only works when you're listening to what would Jesus do? What does he want for us? So here's the problem. They wouldn't see what Paul was teaching at first because the law caused them problems and the fading glory uh, from Moses' face was evident that the law that he was teaching then was also fading. It, was, it, it brought them to understanding who God was and all that, but it didn't bring them to salvation. Why? Because there was still sin. And so you needed a savior. That's why it's so important to know who Jesus is. Because he is the one who saved you from all of that. You can live all different types of lives, but it does not matter. In the end, did you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? So it says here, it says, now the Lord is spirit, and where there is spirit, there is freedom. Um, and so you have to continue to walk towards God. We share um, in the image of Jesus Christ and continue to move from glory to glory. Now, you have to know this. Only Moses could go up the mountain and come back down glowing back then. You see that? None of the other people who followed him went up and came back glowing. Only Moses could do that. That's the old. That's faded out. In the new, every single one of us can go up the mountain of God. Every single one of us can glow up God. Did you see the woman of God glowing up God this morning? Every single one of us can get into his praise. Every single one of us can receive what Moses had. Why? Because Jesus Christ died and that made every one of us able to be Moses. Every one of us can go to God. Every one of us are brothers and sisters in Christ. You know what that means? I have access to Jesus. You have access to Jesus. Your mother has access to Jesus. Your father has access to Jesus. Every single person who believes in Christ has access to Jesus. You have the same access. So how many people in here want to glow of the glory of God. It's so simple. If you see Moses walk up and come back down, you'll be like, I want some of that. Now you have access to it. Do you take access to it? Do you uh, access it every day? Do you look for God every day? So with ever increasing glory, all is welcome. If you want to welcome yourselves into God's glory, Look for what Jesus says about your circumstance and your situation and always follow him. Don't follow your history. Don't follow your future. Follow Jesus. Can I get an amen this morning? Can y'all stand to your feet and give God glory if you agree with the word of God this morning? Can we clap our hands this morning? Amen. 